And finally, British Telecom launched a preliminary trial of its voice recognition system this week. It takes the form of a computer adventure game, but instead of a computer, you use an ordinary telephone. Instructions are given to the 20 megabyte microcomputer in BT's Martlesham Research Center by speaking down the phone. Repeat after me. North. North. South. South. After a newspaper published the X directory number, all lines to the game were engaged. However, it is due to go public in April. Right, thank you, Leslie. And now, if you've often wondered what Santa looks like in his shirt sleeves, here he is, John Cole, <laughs> together with a huge selection of prezies. Right, a lot to get through here, John. Where should we start? Right, this is a piece of speech synthesis software for the BBC Micro. We'll come to those in a moment. Right. Um, this, you just load into the computer, into the BBC, and then you can t type a file, a word process file, and it will actually speak it out of the loudspeaker without having any special chip in the machine. And just £10. Yes, really actually, good value. Actually, we've got a tape of that speaking, so let's see what you think of it. There's that tongue twister that we used earlier in the scene. <laughs> oh, thank you kindly. Well, I think you can make it out in among the yes. buzzing. Now, this is a word processor programme. It's from Mastertronic. It costs about £15 pounds and it's for the Commodore 64 or the uh, 128. It's a very simple one but apparently it's quite adequate for its purposes. Not, not bad at 15 quid. Mm. This is one of the best-selling hardware add-ons this year. It's the AMX mouse and you can get this for the BBC computer, the Amstrad or the Spectrum in a price about 70 to 90 pounds. But to capitalize on that a bit and give you some extra facilities, AMX be quiet, cat. <laughs> AMX have brought out another thing called PageMaker, and that enables you to take bits of text and move them around and generate uh, something that looks like a newspaper. It's very much like the Macintosh software, but this one only costs £50, available for the BBC Micro. But you do need the mouse. You do. Well, that's what's getting the cats excited. We'll come to you in a minute. <laughs> right, books, books. There are some super books yes. here. These are great. I do like the Osborne series. They're very cheap. They're very good. They're written for children, in fact, but there's a lot of good information in there. This one starts off explaining what a word processor is all about, lots of cartoons, but by the end, there's, there's actually a whole shopper's guide mm. to commercial There's a whole range of these books on different topics, and they're targeted not only at very young people, but also people who really know what they, they want to do. And uh, really been edited in a very professional way. I strongly recommend those. First rate. Yeah. Another book, uh, Practical Hardware Projects by Joe Telford for £9. If you want to get your soldering iron out and build things, that's really quite interesting. Artificial intelligence is really one of the buzzwords these days, and uh, this book shows the basics of it in both sense of the word, the basic language and the fundamentals. Quite interesting. We've got um, a bit of not very uh, artificial intelligence here. Just look at this thing, isn't it? Uh, quite stunning. It looks around to find out where it is, and go on, move, that's it, and we're off. Excellent. Artificial <laughs> idiocy, but I think I can top it with this dog here. Come on, pooch. Look at that. So right. it does everything you tell him. Now, let me put the dog amongst the cats and show you what's been making all this noise down here. Come on, on your marks. That's right, and we're off. And to add to that, we have the formation dancing team, uh, or should I say the synchronised swimmers, yes. uh, which are undoubtedly get near one. Oh, <laughs> nice one. Got his they were synchronised. <laughs> if you wanted a setup like this at home, John, how much is it going to cost you? Well, the robots are snip at about £170, uh, without skull caps for the swimming. Um, the uh, big cat, about £70, and the little cats, about £50. Clearly essential. Well, the dog likes it. Of course, if you don't like that kind of din, what about making your own din with this thing, which I demonstrated earlier in the series, the Spec Drum right. Unit for the Spectrum computer. Uh, very good value at £30, and they've just released a new kit of Latin American sounds. Can you give us a sample of the, oh, um, the music on there? I believe you're rather good. <laughs> Fantastic. <Not bad>. <laughs> All right, now this is something for people like me who are completely incapable of playing these complex video games. No coordination. You plug it into either an Electron, Spectrum, Amstrad, Commodore 64 or BBC, and then turn this knob down and the game slows right down so you can actually get uh, the machines and actually hit the thing things. thing to want to do though, isn't it? Yes, I suppose so, but Max seems to be doing rather well. He's got a high score of 101 credits on Elite. <laughs> Starting with 100, of course. <laughs> so you can play it at normal speed, but you can actually oh. crank the speed down. Oh, I think he's been zapped. Come on, own up, Mac. That's been set up all afternoon. I zapped them. <laughs> Tough luck, Mac. Well, that, of course, was Elite, which is a, a very good game, I'm told. I haven't been hooked myself. Rate. But that is a version for the Spectrum, just right. released at 14.95. And if you've got that sort of money to spend, well, what about this? Also for the Spectrum, it's Lord of the Rings from the same people that brought you The Hobbit. However, this one, 15.95, you get two tapes, and the book, Fellowship of the Wrong Rings, not the wrongs, which is described on the back as the ultimate hint book. I don't know if Tolkien would have liked that, but there <laughs> okay, you go. Okay, slightly smaller hints here. These little hints are only £1.99 a shot, 
uh, for the cassette. There's some really cheap game software available for a whole range of machines and very, very good. This is bringing the, the software down to the price where kids can save up for a couple of weeks and buy some stuff. It's good. 199 from Mastertronic. Mm. And to give you an idea of the kind of value you get, here's a game being played. It's called The Last V8. Ah, it's not playing at the moment, it's in demo mode. There we go. We've had to put it in demo mode because nobody here could master it. <laughs> We've all got two shaky hands, including the cameraman. Um, actually, this seems to be the year of the race game. Mm. We've got another one here, which is 3D Grand Prix for the Amstrad, which Leslie is getting absolutely first rate at. £9.95. Ah, she's crashed! <laughs> Mark Sura. He's about to try out the latest type of Olivetti. turbocharged Formula One Olivetti Brabham car in the 1985 British Grand Prix. An enormous crowd watching the race. The conditions are absolutely perfect. The track is dark dry, the sky is blue, the sun is shining. However good the conditions, calculating car speeds which regularly touch 200 miles an hour isn't easy. But it's what motor racing is all about. So inevitably, now that cars are named after computers, Car speeds are also calculated by computer. Each car is fitted with a radio transmitter carried in its nose cone, which identifies it to the computer network. The signal which identifies each car is received by an aerial hidden in the finishing line, from which the computer can calculate its lap time and its position. Right, meanwhile, Mark Sura in the Olivetti Brabham. Mark Sura, 120.901. 120.901. Up in the timing room at Silverstone, a whole gang of personal computers has moved in. But they still keep the old-fashioned methods going, using the human eyeball to identify the car and breaking a beam on the line to time it. They work out the placings by biro. But some of the old timers don't find the new system completely foolproof. I've got this super sophisticated computerized monitor readout thing which gives me all the positions of the drivers and the gaps between the drivers. Now there's just one problem of that from my point of view and that it is inevitably one lap adrift because it, it can't complete its information, assimilate everything and play it back to me until all 26 cars or however many are running at the time have crossed the line. Murray has particularly painful memories of the end of the French Grand Prix. <laughs> PK was winning the race, Prost was in second place, Rosberg was in third position, De Angelis was fourth and Johansson was fifth. And that of course was what the readout was telling me. Now, I had to finish absolutely on the dot in terms of time. On that last lap, Rosberg passed Prost and took second place and Johansson passed De Angelis on the line and took fourth position. As a result of which I regret to say four out of the top positions I gave were wrong. And the chequered flag is uh, waving at this point now. So to our consternation, it looks as though the British Grand Prix is being finished on the 65th lap, but whatever. This time Mary got it right, the computer got it right, but the manual timekeepers didn't. At the end of the 66 lap race, they brought down the checkup flag one lap too early. Nelson Piquet, fourth, Mark Sura, fifth, and, and Mark Sura finally finished fifth. Also, one lap too early. Now I've been joined for a few punchlines, as you might say, by Michael Bywater, deputy editor and computer correspondent of Punch. Michael, you gave me one of these adventure games to try, and I must say, I'm not an aficionado. Do you really enjoy them? 
I can't actually answer that question right at the moment because I've got this problem here. Uh, what has happened is we're in the land of Sodom. We're actually on the dune on Elor, and we've got to get to the mystery lake to talk to this negotiable beetle who will give us the uh, manic woodcutters <laughs> thing. That's, um, it's just like real life, really. You meet people and you shake hands and you kill them. Real I, life in punch, no doubt. Real life in punch. <laughs> what we've got here is something which, which highlights the problem of these, these blasted games. You attack Krillin, you kill Krillin, whoever he may be, you travel north, you see the bar. What is a reasonable thing to say at that point? A reasonable thing to say at that point is buy a drink. There we have it. I don't understand buy. I don't understand buy. Maybe it should be kill the drink, but every time you seem to meet something, a krillon or a gru or whatever it is in these games, you actually go out and kill it, I stab know. it, knife it, providing yeah. you've oiled the knife in the blood of something you met beforehand. That's no, it's not the blood of the something. You see, what it's got to be is the drink that you find in the sack with the luncheon that krillon has got, and then the gru comes in and he gets the knife, but he's already got the oil from the sunken lake. You pull the... <laughs> but you like them. What's a good one secretly, versus... Yes. yes. Well, we all secretly enjoy computer games of yeah. some sort or another. Is this your favourite? I, I heard that adventure games were for the older people, and I thought, well, I'm an older person, I don't enjoy them. So I said, what's meant by an older person? They said, somewhere between 9 and 11. Ah, yeah, mental age, yes. Well, I'm, I'm working up there slowly. I don't know, what always strikes me as very, very strange is that you have all this magnificent technology totally at the disposal of creating a sort of sub-medieval universe. I mean, if it was all futuristic, there's one or two that are. Hitchhiker's Guide to Galaxy is futuristic. But this is all, I mean, what is this? The legend, the nine tasks of the unnamed one. You have to find somebody called Aravor Shape Changer. What on earth has that got to do with anything? <laughs> do some of them get more involved in personality? Some of them seem to be based on books I, I've yeah. seen, like Hitchhiker. Well, the Hitchhiker one was. Right, and yes. you, well, you've got restrictions. You obviously can't do what you can do in a book. but. The trouble is that if you're trying to put something on a computer like the Spectrum, you're very limited by the size of the machine. It does actually require an awful lot of brain to write prose. What other sort of me. games do you like, apart from the, the text games? Well, some of the shoot 'em ups are great fun, but they're sort of limited, really. I mean, once you've shot down the encroaching spaceships once or twice, you've had enough. You want to they've gone a lot less couple. popular recently, haven't they? I hear that games sell well if they've got a lot of good music with them. Have oh. you encountered games with music? Do you think that's rubbish? Yeah, the ride of the Valkyrie as the grooves come down and get you with the drink that you didn't buy from the sack. And it's all going to be the same, <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I did see one that I quite liked. It was called Winter Games, and uh, there was the runner running up to the bowl, and he lit the flame, and the doves flew off, and the music played, and the flags blew in the breeze. I thought that was quite nice. And, and then, then, the, could... then the computer crashes, and, <laughs> and, and you've lost the game. Well, you could go but... down the bobsleigh and then kill one of the referees as he bobbed up out of the ice. You've got to kill the referee before you get on. It is <laughs> ludicrous, isn't it? But I think they're, they're, get, they're getting fun. They are, isn't they? I've always had a secret uh, liking for pinball machines, and I bought a pinball construction kit for a computer, and you can actually construct your own pinball So that you machine. always win. You always win. You that's can make great. it easy as anything. And has it got somewhere you can put a glass of beer on the top? That's, <laughs> that's vital. You have to have a user configurable <laughs> glass of beer. Well, so far so good, but what would you imagine would be your ultimate game? What would it Ooh. look like? All the technology, laser holograms and, and sound and artificial sensor armor and the whole thing, it'd be a real life simulator. And the point would be that if you got into a situation like this where you really didn't have anything more to say, what you could do is just press a little escape key which would be located on your knee somewhere and you'd cut somewhere else. And you go into another life shape altogether and into another lifestyle. Another universe, another anything, another studio, could be anything, I don't know. And would you imagine that was full of battles, or would you think World it was War negotiating III. with World editors? No, no, negotiating with real people. Again, like, it's a single-person game. Wouldn't you like a two-person game? I like a hundred-person game. If we could all, everyone, the whole universe, <laughs> playing this, this gigantic game, we'd never have to go out at all. Michael, thank you very much. <laughs> well, that's it for today, for this week, for this year, come to that. We're back on Friday, January the 17th, with a special programme from the Witch Computer Show in Birmingham. But just before we go, as you know, MicroLive searches high and low to discover worthwhile, important uses for computer technology. And this Christmas, we've come up with a real cracker. Take it away. Oh, 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 oh my goodness. Happy Christmas. Wonderful. Happy Christmas. Happy Christmas. Oh. Oh. Oh.